Um, my name is Heidi Deacon. Uh, you guys know me. I'm the director here at Smith Library. And we are so honored to have Ken Gloss here. He is from Battle's Bookshop. It's just like mm. world famous, this guy. <laughs> and we are so honored to have him. And I'm just sorry more people didn't show up, but he is the expert well, on books. And so ask your questions, enjoy this, this uh, talk tonight. And um, we hope to learn from you, Ken. Well, Welcome. Thank, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Again, the weather, I totally understand, although I think it's gonna, we're going to get through this before it really gets cold and icy out there. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. what, I, what I do in a talk, the talk will last 45 minutes or so. Uh, the first half hour, I'll talk about what is an old book, first editions, uh, give a little bit of my history background, show off a few of the things that I brought, um, and tell some stories, anecdotes of peaceful places, things that I've seen. Then what I like, that's the first half hour. The, then the next 10 or 15 minutes, I like to do question and answer because I can go on and on and on and on about old books. And at least with question and answer, I can go on about what you want to listen to. Uh, the last minute or two of the talk, uh, I will appraise one or two books from the people here to everybody in detail. After that, I'll end the formal part of the talk. I'll stay here. I'll answer any and all questions. I'll do all of the appraisals. I'll just do them a lot more informally. Um, and, uh, you know, there, is, there isn't that large a group. Uh, usually, I try not to do questions while I'm talking. But quite honestly, if someone has a quick question, it's a small group, why not? Uh, anyways. Usually when people talk about collecting in old books, uh, they want to know what the value is. And uh, the first printed book, in other words, what's an old book? What's, and usually mean by that, what's an old and rare book? Well, the first printed book was in 1456, the Gutenberg Bible. If any of you have a Gutenberg Bible, <laughs> let me assure you that it's valuable. Uh, matter of fact, the last time uh, part of one sold, half of it sold for four and a half million dollars. Single pages sell between 50 and 100 thousand dollars on average. But any book printed in the 1400s has value, some more than others, but anything in the 1400s is valuable. After that, it depends on what the book is. You can have a book printed in the 1500s that was a relatively dull and an interesting book then, and it's still a relatively dull and an interesting book now, and nobody cares or will pay very much for it. On the other hand, you can have relatively recent books. The first edition of the first Harry Potter book in London, which is only a little over 20 years old, can sell upwards of $100,000. So it's all what people are looking for, what they want. And I get loads of calls at the store, people saying, I have an old book and I know it's an old book, and the way I know it's an old book is the pages are all brown and crumbling. Well, I point out that's more lousy paper than it is how old the book is. Now, this is a page from a book, and I'm going to pass this around. Some of the things that I show off tonight, I won't pass around. They'll be up at the front, and some of them are small. But you'll see this isn't terribly fragile. The paper's white. The ink's black. Uh, it's one of the earliest books done with illustrations. This page was printed in the 1490s, so it's a little over 500 years old. And you sort of say to yourself, well, gee, if they could make books like that then, why don't they do it now? Well, there was a big disadvantage to a book like that. First of all, in the 1490s, you had to be quite wealthy to get an education to learn how to read. You had to be almost nobility to be able to afford to buy a book like that. Nowadays, maybe the books aren't quite as well made, but they're at a price that can be distributed in the millions. And the real value of books is the knowledge in the books and the dissemination of that knowledge. And I think it's a very good trade-off. Also, when you talk about book collecting, inevitably somebody will always come up and say, I have a first edition. <laughs> I have a first edition. How much is it worth? And I point out that most first editions 
never came out in a second edition, probably never should have come out in a first edition. Nobody wants them, cares about them, or would pay anything whatsoever. A book has to be historically, scientifically, literarily, or for some other reason important that there are a group of collectors out there who want it. And usually when you think of first editions, you think of literature. Dickens, Twain, Faulkner, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, and so on. And even within that, there are a lot of things that make a big difference in the price. The condition being one of the most important. The paper dust jacket on a 20th century book can make all the difference in the world. My father had a copy of William Faulkner's second book called Mosquitoes. Absolutely pristine, as if someone took it from the publisher, sealed it away, at the time he got it, he sold it within a week for $750. At the exact same time, another book dealer had the same book, Mosquitoes Fogged on First Edition. It didn't have the paper dust jacket, had a few tiny little nicks and bumps on it, nothing terrible. It took them a year to sell it at $40. Because a lot of collecting is prestige. It's being able to say, look what I have. I have the best. I have the most wonderful. Essentially, I have what you don't have. And people who can afford it will pay the absolute top price for the very, very best, but might not consider spending anything at all for something even slightly less. Other things that can affect the value, signed by the author. Well, once again, if the author is unknown and unheard, the fact that it's signed might not mean much. Maybe one of your relatives wrote a book of poetry, had 50 copies, signed it, gave it to family members. It might mean an awful lot to your family, but it doesn't necessarily add much to the price. On the other hand, if it's signed by someone famous, maybe Ernest Hemingway, that could add hundreds if not thousands of dollars to the value. In almost any type of collecting that you get into, there are nuances that add or subtract to the value. And I use sign books to show that off a little. Um, there are some authors that are almost impossible to get their signature. J.D. Salinger, for instance, who wrote Catcher in the Rye. He lived up in her, here in New Hampshire. He was reclusive. He didn't appear in public, essentially didn't publish anymore. And other than to a very close personal friend, absolutely would not sign a book. Thus, his signature adds thousands of dollars to the value because you just can't get them. And, and matter of fact, a little aside, sometimes ask, people ask me, is there anything that people have brought into you that you wish you had gotten, but you didn't? You're sort of like the fish that got away. There, there was one time a man came into the store. He was a friend of J.D. Salinger, and he had about 10 letters from Salinger. They were sort of personal letters and notes. And, you know, they were nice, but there was one letter in particular that I liked. Um, Salinger was writing to him and looking back on when he first moved to New Hampshire. And he was looking back on when he first had his house built. And he mentioned that a bunch of high school kids helped when the foundation was being laid, that they did the labor and manual thing. And he basically said in this letter, and one of those kids turned out to be a really good athlete, that kid Carlton Fisk. Turned, <laughs> so Carlton Fisk helped build J.D. Salinger's house. I personally think that letter maybe should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. I mean, it's just an interesting thing. Uh, in any case, and then there are uh, some authors that uh, their signatures are relatively easy to get. There was an author in New England. He wrote wonderful ghost sea, buried treasure, pirate stories of the New England coast. His name was Edward Rose Snow. Um, and he was a friend of my father, and I knew him. And I remember one day he came into our shop. He uh, said that he had just been on Cape Cod. Snow had gone into a store that he had never, bookstore that he had never been in before, went right up to the section where his books were, pulled one off the shelf, opened it up, and exclaimed, My! A rare, unsigned copy. <laughs> and then he took out a pen and signed it. <laughs> and then he introduced himself to the owner of the store. So books signed by Edward Rose Snow don't add as much to the value. <laughs> um, the, um, my father uh, had a copy of F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic, The Great Gatsby. 
Now, just opposite what I was saying before, it was a first edition. It didn't have the jacket. It was actually very well worn and red. Uh, but when you opened it up, there was an inscription to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Scott Fitzgerald. And in addition to that inscription, when T.S. Eliot read the book, he made marginal notes, annotations, comments, crossed things out, added things into just about every page of the book. That book now would be worth hundred, two, three, maybe even four hundred thousand dollars because of the association. Uh, one last story about signed and autographed books. There was an autograph and manuscript dealer in New England. He was one of the more prominent in the world. But when he was a young boy, he used to collect books by Robert Frost. And he knew Robert Frost. And when he was uh, about 13 years old, he went to London. He bought a copy of Frost's first book called A Boy's Will, a first edition. Paid a lot of money for it at the time. It's very complicated what really is the first edition. Came back to New England. He f uh, he knew Frost, and a few weeks later, he met with Frost, and he said, look what I've got. And Frost looked at it and said, well, what did you pay for it? And he told him. Frost said, give me the book. And on the front two end papers, he opened it up and wrote a two-page description of how to tell the first binding from the second binding, from the third binding, from the fourth binding, why they change bindings, the different colors of the bindings, on and on and on for two pages, signed it, closed the book, handed it back to the boy and said, now it's worth what you paid for it. Uh, uh, in any case, let me digress a little and give you a little bit of my background in the history of the store. The history of the Brattle Bookshop goes back to the 1820s. But for all practical purposes, it was going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married, my mother had $500, and with that they bought half interest in the store. And it's always been in Boston. People call from Harvard Square on Brattle Street saying, where are you? We tell them we're in downtown Boston. When my parents first bought the store, there was a little side street in what was Scully Square called Brattle Street. To make it even more confusing, the street doesn't exist anymore. It's where Boston City Hall Plaza is now. And we've had seven different locations over the years. My father built the store on his great love of books, his hard work, his knowledge. And he was a bit of a character and a showman. And every time he'd move the store, when it was planned, he would move the best books to the new location, then he'd run sales. Half price dollar, 50 cent quarter dime. But last day of the sale, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bags, packs, satchels, whatever, ring a big bell, the people would go charging into the store, grab whatever they could grab. Five minutes later, he'd ring the bell again, that group would leave, the next group would come in, and he gave away over 250,000 books that way. <laughs> Now, the last time he did this was in 1969, and we were moving from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall to West Street, where we are now. And at the end of the giveaway, there were books left over. And like I said, my father was a bit of a character and a showman, if you can sort of picture this. He hired a covered wagon with a cowboy and a horse team, and on the cover of the covered wagon, it said, go west, book lovers, go 5 West Street, Brattle Bookshop. They filled it up with books, and they drove it from the end of Washington Street, again, near Boston City Hall, up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Common to where West Street is, and then back down Washington Street with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. Now, the superintendent in charge of the traffic was a friend of his, told him he could do it all morning, but within an hour, the city was in an absolute standstill. They told him to stop. He didn't care. He'd gone on his point across, and we've been on West Street since then. And when we first moved in, we were in a five-story, 150-year-old wooden building, absolutely crammed full of books. In February of 1980, I got a call at 4 o'clock in the morning. The building was on fire. It literally burnt to the ground. I mean, it was 100% gone. But uh, then what happened was we wanted to keep going, to continue, not go out of business. We found a storefront a few doors down in the street. Uh, we rented folding tables. People either sold, gave us, donated books. Uh, Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time, came down with a carload of books. And even though it was a mega stock, within a month we reopened. And the main thing was just keep going. Over the next four years, we slowly but surely rebuilt the stock. 
four years after that, we bought the building we're in now, which is, again, a few doors down on West Street. And it's sort of the old Dickensian tile, style of store. Outside stands at a dollar, three and five, two floors of general used books, a third floor with rare books, autographs, manuscripts, leather bindings, and so on. And that type of bookstore, the old, large, old, general, secondhand bookstore, is a dying business. And it's not dying because people don't like books, buy books, read books, sell books, but particularly in the inner cities, property value has gone so high, that rent has gone so high, that old bookstores, which are not the most efficiently run businesses in the world, one right after the other have been going out of business. And in the last few years, the internet has just speeded that process along. Now, like I say, we bought our building in the early 80s, so I hope to do this for years to come. I have daughters who are in their early 30s. I don't think they have any interest in going into the business the way I have. And I've done this all my life. My parents, would say my first word was book. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it was. They were, I'm sure they were talking about them all the time. And then I worked after school in elementary school, junior high school, high school, summers during college. I have a degree in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts. I was going to get a doctoral degree at the University of Wisconsin, but in 1973, I needed a year off. My father's health wasn't that good. That year now has been, what, 46 years? And I don't regret for a minute that I'm doing this and not in a laboratory somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show off a few of the things and tell some stories. One thing I will mention, uh, I have a card here. I do a podcast now, and I've, they're 15, 20 minutes. So if you like the stories that I tell, uh, I've got about 60 of them out, and I put out a new one every two weeks. But uh, in any case, if you were to ask me what's one item that I wish I could find, and I know this is small, but it's a little pamphlet here called Tamerlane by a Bostonian done in 1827. It doesn't look like very much, but the Bostonian who did this was Edgar Allan Poe. It's his first book. It's a classic rarity in American literature. As a matter of fact, the first copy to ever really be found was on a uh, dealer's 10 cent table. Another book dealer spotted it there, bought a whole stack of books so it wouldn't stand out. <laughs> and in 1890, sold it for $1,000. Then in the 1950s, there were two postmen in the New Bedford area who on the side were book scouts. And being postmen, they knew where all the yard sales were. Went to a yard sale, bought a trunk of books, bottom of the trunk, Tamerlane. Families got involved, they got to negotiating, and after six months they sold it for $10,000. Now I don't know if it was worth it because they started out best of friends. By the time they sold it, they never spoke again, but they got their $10,000. And then about 20 years ago, an antique dealer died in the Newburyport area. Whole estate was auctions, painting, prints, furniture, antiques, books as a group, $600 to an antique dealer in New Hampshire. They put all the pamphlets in a box, $15 each. Someone, of course, picked out a Tamerlane. 20 years ago, sold it for $198,000. One sold a couple of years ago for $800,000. And let me just say, this is a facsimile. A lot of what I bring are originals. I don't bring million dollar pamphlets. But if any of you want to take a close look and then go home and check your attic, cellars, basements, whatever, if you find one, Please give me a call. I'd love to hear about it. A lot of the fun of collecting and a lot of what makes something valuable is your knowledge, your understanding, your appreciation. You know, someone might look at something and say, oh, that's a scrap of paper. Someone else might say that's a broadside that led to the Boston Tea Party, that led to the American Revolution, that led to our country's independence. So it's really that knowledge and understanding that makes something interesting and thus valuable. Now, this is an item that on the surface I think is interesting, and the story behind it may be even more so. This is on White House stationery. It's dated April 11th, 1933, and it starts, Dear Jim, I want to send you this note to tell you how happy I am that you are to represent the United States in Poland. It's a most important post, et cetera, et cetera. Signed always sincerely, Franklin Roosevelt. And it's to the Honorable James Michael Curley, Mayor of Boston. Now on the surface, this seems like a great honor. It's an ambassadorial appointment. 
Well, Curley didn't think it was such an honor. Matter of fact, I think he thought Roosevelt was trying to get rid of him, which of course he probably was. And uh, Curley's response was, remember, this was 1933. He said, in Poland, with Germany on one side, Russia on the other, you should send your worst Republican enemy to Poland. He said, matter of fact, if you think it's so important, why don't you quit and go there yourself? <laughs> now, Curley's opinion of Washington didn't change over the years. We also have about 10 letters he wrote to his wife when he was in Danbury Prison. Now, even though these were personal letters, he was still very much the politician. And there was one quote I particularly liked. He had just gotten into prison, and he wrote to his wife, and he said, Many of the four-legged creatures in my cell have more honor than the two-legged creatures in Washington. In any case, enough for Curley. Uh, I have other things here that uh, not just books, but programs, brochure, pamphlets. Here's a program from the 1912 World Series where the Red Sox won the World Series in 1912. Uh, they won a few more times in the teens. Then had to wait a long, long time. Um, the only thing that worries is the Red Sox have won four times in the teens. I just hope we don't have to wait as long for the next one. But not only is this interesting as a baseball item, but on the back there's an ad for arrow shirts and collars. Collars are two for a quarter. Shirts are a dollar and a half and two dollars. Don't know that you'll get them for that anymore. It's also become very popular to go on cruises and cruise ships. And I have a brochure here for a ship. It tells you how wonderfully built it is, where to book passage, and anyone who wants to go on the Titanic. Uh, this is an original brochure. And almost anything you can think of, there are people out there who are interested. There are whole societies of Titanic historians who do nothing but study the Titanic. There's also a tendency, when you talk about collectibles, now I talk about books and, and so on, that all of a sudden everything seems to be worth thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And I like to point out not everything has to be high priced to be fun. Old Life magazines, for instance. Here's one with Errol Flynn on the cover. Another with Elizabeth Taylor when she was 15 years old. And most of these just sell for a few dollars. There are a few exceptions that go higher, but there's just so many of them around. We used to have a wall by a store, by a, uh, a wall by a stairway at the store that we had a few hundred of the more famous lifes there, and people would stop and stare at that wall, sometimes a half an hour, an hour at a time, just lost in thought and memory. They loved them for the covers, the stories, the articles. They made wonderful birthday or anniversary presents if you fell on the right dates. And then one day, uh, a regular customer came in, and he bought about 50 Life magazines from World War II, and it wasn't what he normally bought. So I said to him, why are you buying these? And he said, well, I want to teach my uh, son and children about World War II, and he thought a nice way to do it would be to get a few of the Life's, look at a few of the pictures, read a couple of the articles, and then discuss it with them. So actually, it sounded like a, a good idea to me. I was skeptical about it. Uh, but in any case, he came in a few weeks later, and I said to him, how's it going with the life? And he said, fabulously, but not the way I thought. He says the kids don't care about the stories, the articles, the photographs, but they love the ads. Oh. And he says, and it turns out by looking at and discussing the ads with them, he could probably teach them more about what the United States was like during World War II than if they had looked and read everything else. Um, I have a cookbook from the 1700s. Some of the recipes are wonderful. And then you have how to bake eels the common way. And I don't know if I want to bake them anyway, but that's beside the point. Uh, one of the most interesting parts about the business for me is going out to houses and estates. That's how we get most of our books. It's almost like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island every day, never knowing who you're going to meet, what you're going to see, the people, the places, the characters. And I'll, uh, I'll relate a few of those stories to you, and then after that, maybe see about a few of the questions, and then uh, go from there. Uh, I was out of the store, and I got back. There was a message that a Mrs. Fisher had called, and she had some books. Uh, 
I called her up and she said, oh, yes, my father died in Providence. He has 500 art reference books. We want to get the best price we can, and we're inviting a number of dealers down to bid on them. Would you be interested? Well, 500 art reference books sounds like a nice library. Providence is only an hour away from Boston, and we go a lot further than that many times. Uh, go all over New England and the Northeast, and we were just in Chicago looking bo at books. But in any case, it sounded like a nice library. Uh, she, they lived in an old street called Benefit Street up near Brown University. I got to the house. It was a large old colonial house. I got led through the house into a courtyard, into a garage. Second floor of the garage, there were 5,000 books. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out her married name was Fisher. Her father's name was John Nicholas Brown. Family founded Brown University, one of the wealthier families in the country. And after about six months, I bought about 80% of the books I wanted. I was happy. She was pleased. And she said, my mother has a lot of books. Most are being given to the university. Some are being sold at auction. But would you like to go to Newport to take a look at the books there? Well, their house in Newport is one of the mansions on the ocean. I mentioned this to my wife. She decided to come with me on this deal. And one of the fascinating parts about it was being in one of those mansions that was still being lived in by a family, and at one point wandering from the basement to the attic, all on my own, without a tour guide saying, come here, go there, but just literally wandering through the whole place. It was fascinating. Another time I got called to Newport to do an appraisal, another mansion, not quite as big as the Browns. This was the Perry family, Commodore Perry, Oliver Hazard Perry. And I, uh, I do hundreds of free appraisals at groups like this. Um, you know, one of the ways that I want people, when you think of an old book, that you think of me in the Brattle Bookshop. I don't care if you think of 10 others, but one of the ways I feel I can do that is by giving out as much free information as reasonably possible. But there are times when people need very formal written appraisals for insurance, estate taxes. Then we discuss fees. In any case, this was another mansion in Newport. Um, and uh, what they had was a whole stack of papers from the War of 1812. During the war, their family were privateers. Well, they're privateers if you're on our side. They're pirates if you're on the other side. It's all the way you look at it. But it was the day-to-day -day accountings of the ships. They would sometimes capture a ship and realize tens of thousands of dollars profit. In 1812, that was an incredible amount of money. Then one day, one of the ships got into a battle. The ship got hit. The captain got hit. He lost his leg. Three days later, there was a tiny entry at the bottom of a page, and it said, Captain. $5 bonus, loss of leg. And that was the last you heard of the captain. So that's a little different nowadays, too. When my father was still alive, and he died over 35 years ago, we got a call from a lady. She was very vague about her name, who she was, what she had. But it sounded like she might have some interesting things. She was fairly close by, so we decided to go out to her house. We got to the house, and it was a little ranch house. Paint was peeling, weeds were growing. And you sort of say, oh, gee, what's going to be here? She answered the door. She was quite elderly. We walk in, and there are just gorgeous antiques everywhere. I mean, really, really beautiful antiques. And she got to talking. It turned out she was originally from the Boston area, but she had married the prince of the Ukraine, the cousin of the Tsar of Russia. He had escaped just before the revolution. And she told story after story about being Russian nobility in Europe, all the court intrigues, all the goings on, how T.E. Shaw used to stay at their house all the time, how she didn't think he accidentally died on a motorcycle, but there was a lot more to it. T.E. Shaw, of course, was Lawrence of Arabia. And she went on and on and on with these wonderful stories. Turned out her books were lousy. But the stories were absolutely <laughs> wonderful. And when we first got into her house, on one of her walls, she had 10 watercolors. They were about this size, pastoral European scenes. And when I first got in, I looked at them. I thought they were nice. And the more she talked, and the longer we were there, and the more I looked at them, the nicer I thought they were. And I finally said to her, those 10 watercolors, they're really nice. And she sort of turned around and said, oh, yes, they're all Turners. So she had 10 original Turner watercolors, probably a million dollars worth of paintings. It was like, Oh, yes, they're all. So you never know what you're going to see, the people, the places, the characters. As a matter of fact, speaking of characters, about 
25 years ago, we went to one of our customers' 100th birthday parties. Now, when you go to a man's 100th birthday party, and he goes, I just got back from Barcelona, I'm going to give a talk in Florida, and I've been asked to lecture in Tokyo. <laughs> and I finally said to him, wait a minute, you're 100 years old. Don't you think Tokyo is an awfully long way to go? And he said, well, when I used to work, it took me well over 25 hours to get to Chicago. I said, I don't think Tokyo's a whole lot further than that nowadays. <laughs> and here's a man who could tell you about one day sitting down to dinner with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. Now, obviously, he was much younger at the time. And he said he was really looking forward to this dinner and all the learning and insight he was going to get from these two men. He said he was excited. He got there a little bit early. He said about five minutes later, Ford came in and sat down next to him. And about 15 minutes later, Edison came in. Now, Edison was quite elderly, had one of those big horns for hearing, sat down opposite. And he said the first thing, Ford turned to Edison and yelled, my Tom, you look very good. And Edison turned to Ford and yelled, it's the Carter's little liver pills. <laughs> this man said all night long, all they did was yell about Carter's little liver pills. <laughs> and he said next time he wanted to learn something, he went to the library. <laughs> uh, I can go on and on and on with these stories. I'll tell one more and then maybe see about some questions. We get hundreds of phone calls at the store, people wanting to know, do you have a book? Can you get a book? How hard is it to get the book? Does the book exist? Or what's the value? How much is it worth? And so on. And most of those questions, either I or the people I work with, we can answer right off the top of our head. Some are a little involved. And every once in a while, there's some you have to really do some research. But that can be really interesting. But every once in a while, you get a call that really stands out. And again, this was a while ago. I answered the phone, hello, Brattle Bookshop, can I help you? Lady, elderly, very thick Irish brogue, and the first thing she says is, President Kennedy slept with me. <laughs> Do you have to admit that gets your attention? And she stopped and waited for it to sink in. And then she went on to explain that she had worked for the Kennedy family. She had been his nursemaid. When he was three and four years old, he used to fall asleep in her arms. So he did sleep with her, but maybe not what you first thought. And what she had was a whole series of handwritten letters from the president. Now, presidential letters of any type have value, but handwritten letters, especially from a later 20th century president, are scarce, hard to get, and rare. She wanted to get a value on them uh, and maybe sell them. I was actually skeptical about that, but I thought she'd be fun to meet. I went to her house. She was great. Loads of stories. Uh, I gave her what I thought was a tremendous offer on the letters, but much as I suspected, there was no way she could sell these letters. Letters were part of her life. Uh, I left a note behind. Maybe someday I'll hear about them again. As far as I know, her family still has them, probably where they belong. But in any case, I could go on and on and on, but why don't I see if there are some questions. Quite honestly, anything you ask me, I can go off on a tangent anyways. So, uh, but uh, does anyone have any questions? Or Yes. Yes. Um, our, the value of books, have they gone down as so many antiques have? Uh, the question is, have the value of books gone down like many antiques have? And the answer uh, to any general question is, it depends. In many cases and in many things, the value has gone down. But the ones that are truly rare, truly valuable, those really have gone up. There a couple of things uh, have happened, and uh, I mean, collecting changes, tastes change, but that's always happened. But the internet has changed things dramatically. And it's changed things for a number of different reasons. And I could go on and on forever, and I'm not going to do that. But I'll just point out a couple of reasons. Any book that you wanted to buy because you just wanted the information, all the reference books. And you know, when has someone bought an encyclopedia recently? Or even dictionaries. But even it goes even beyond that. If art books, you know, people used to have nice big walls of expensive art books. You'd have Van Gogh, Picasso, but every picture in those books now you can just Google. It will come up, and quite honestly, the quality and the color is probably better, and you can get it cheaply. So those $100, $200 art books now sometimes 
now sell on our three and five dollar tables. But it even goes beyond that. I had a friend come in recently. He was retiring. And he was said, you know, I'm retiring. I want to take up tennis. And he said, do you have any books on learning how to play tennis? And we looked. There were a couple. They were all right. He said, you know, actually, YouTube's much better anyways. Because in YouTube, you can actually see. Yeah. And all of the things, like how to repair a car, how to install this, how to do this. YouTube is better. So all of those books that you would pay actually pretty good prices for 20, 25 years ago, now, you know, other than if they're almost dirt cheap, they don't sell. Also, what happened was a lot of books that you would come into in, let's say, a first edition of that or whatever, and you would pay, come in, we'd have a first edition or another bookstore would have it, and you'd pay a pretty good price for it because you know, you didn't know when you were going to get it, when you were going to find it. Uh, you hadn't seen many of them. But when the internet, it turned out they actually weren't rare. They were just hard to find. So 25 years ago, you might pay $50, $100, $200 dollars for a book because you thought it was a rare book. Now you go click, click. All of a sudden, 100 copies show up. It's, and it's not that you say, well, OK, the cheap one is this, the expensive one is that, so halfway sounds right. Well, no, if you're buying the book and they're the same, it brings it to the lower common denominator. So a lot of things have gone way down in price just because it's much, the internet is much more efficient. It's shown that those things are available. They're out there. And one other way that it's brought the price way down on other books is you sort of always have that picture of the scholar sitting at his desk or her desk. And there's a room of books around so that they could just reach up and pull out something and get that information. Well, Google does that really well with the internet. But the other thing, that person would walk into a bookstore maybe 20 years ago and see a book on the wall in, in, at the store and they say, well, it's a little too high, but I might need this a year or two from now. I better buy it because if I don't buy it now, when I need it, I, I'm going to have a hard time getting it. Well, the thing is, now, again, you go click, click. You find out there are 30 or 40 copies of that book. You go, I'll buy it when I need it, which, of course, essentially comes down to you almost never buy it. Mm -hmm. So it has brought things down. But the truly rare, the truly high priced, the truly perfect copies, they have been going up. And they still will. Uh, the unique. Yeah. But the large majority have gone down. And collecting interest has changed. Anyone else? Yes. You mentioned a dust cover. I don't know what that is. The paper jacket. You know, when you buy a new book, um, well, they don't have one. The book jacket, the paper jacket. Yeah. And that, that paper jacket, because like I said at one point, it's prestige. It's being able to say, look, I've got the perfect one. Now, you know, sometimes it's hard. You, you think of it and you say, well, that paper jacket. If you had Great Gatsby, I, I, since I used that as an example before, the first edition of Great Gatsby in good condition without a paper jacket is a few thousand dollars. It's still a valuable book. It's, it's good. The paper jacket on Great Gatsby is a beautifully designed, beautifully colorful, that was done on terrible paper with lousy ink. So to get that jacket on a first edition is incredibly hard to do. It, it's very, very rare. A perfect copy of Great Gatsby first edition in a dust jacket could sell for a quarter of a million dollars, which means that that paper jacket is essentially worth a quarter of a million dollars. And you say to yourself, well, who would be crazy enough to pay that kind of price? But the collector who wants to say, I have the best. I have that collection that you don't have. And even when you say that, if I put down on the table here, without talking about price, and I put down a copy that was in so-so condition of a first edition of Great Gatsby, and I put down a copy that was in better condition, but maybe without the jacket, and then I put down a copy that a beautiful jacket, and I said, you can have any of these. Which do you like? Which would you like better? You're always going to almost always go for the one with the jacket. The jackets were made to attract your attention. They were made to be beautiful. They were made so that you, when you walked in the store and saw them, you would want that copy. 
And so that's part of what goes into the collecting. And, you know, and it sounds like, why would somebody ever pay that kind of money for just a used book, essentially? And, you know, we, there was a collector in the Midwest, and he had spent, he was very wealthy, he spent about 10 or 15 million dollars on his book collection, you know, whatever the collection was, and they said, you've spent 10 or 15 million dollars on your book collection, why do you collect books? And he said, well, for 10 or 15 million dollars, I can have one of the best book collections in the world, and everybody loves it when I come in the store, and everybody pays attention to this. He said, in modern art, 10 or 15 might, million dollars might get me a little sketch of a Picasso, and that's all. And, you know, and it's not even prestigious, and I don't like it. So, you know, it, it's all a matter of what it is. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, um, a couple of things um, that I talk about when I do appraisals. Did anyone bring a book that has a sort of a decorative cloth binding? Uh, uh, and did anyone bring a Bible? Uh, that will do. I mean, this, uh, this one I brought. It's not that old. Right. But and I just I liked it because of the design. Yeah. So. Uh, and, and I'll tell you what, I'll talk a little bit about appraising now. Uh, I like talking about Bibles. That's what I end the talk with. Uh, but let me say a few things about when I do appraisals. Uh, when I do appraisals at groups like this, I usually give a retail price. In other words, that price that you would pay if you came into a store like mine or mine, it is not what you would get if you're selling the book. If you're selling a book, you should expect to get about a third to two thirds of the retail value. If you're dealing with the very low end, the markup might even be higher just because you've got to make some money. When you get to the very expensive, the percentages can come down. A number of years ago, I had a copy of Audubon's Quadrupeds, not the birds, but the animals, but the big, huge thing. At the time, I paid $100,000 for it. I sold it within two weeks for $105,000. That's only a 5% markup, but it's $5,000, and well worth the time and effort I spent, and I had pretty much had it pre-sold before I even bought it. So when you get to the much, much higher values, especially if something's gonna turn over quickly, the percentages can come down just because the amounts of money involved are so much higher. Also, everything I say is subjective. In other words, the fact that I say something's worth $100 doesn't mean a colleague of mine says 100 and a quarter and another colleague says 75. So if you know what you have, you get a price, you're happy with it, great. If you're not sure, get a second, third, fourth, fifth opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the first book I have here is called Spiders by Bristow. It's actually not quite as old as the example I was going to use, but it was 1947. It has a nice decorative cover of spiders. Actually, this is a, a series of books by Penguin. And, they, and actually, they're very collectible, trying to get the whole series. This one has a few little defects to it. Uh, it's about a $10 or $15 book. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole collection, and you can collect these. And for $10, $20, maybe a few go higher put together a really nice collection. They're just cute, nice, decorative books. Uh, and they have nice illustrations in That's them, really but, but around $10. Yeah. Now, before they had dust jackets widely used on books, when, uh, and dust jackets as we know them were more around World War I. That's because of technology. But before them, a lot of books had very decorative covers like this that people the reason publishers did them with decorative covers like this <coughs> is um, they figured if you walked into the store, the book caught your eye, the more chance you'd buy it. And there are people who collect books like this just for the decorative covers. And you can go to library sales, yard sales, auction houses, old antique stores, and you can pick up a lot of them very, very cheaply. There are some that are expensive, but you can pick them up very cheaply. And individually, they might not seem like much, but decoratively, as a collection, they can be quite nice. As a matter of fact, I have a collection like this myself that started off as a bit of a joke. Um, one day I got a book, had a picture of a toilet 
on the cover. <laughs> the title was Flushed with Pride, The Life of Thomas Crapper. <laughs> Anyways, I got it, I brought it home, I showed it to my wife, she took one look at it, said we have to put this in the bathroom. So we did. A couple of days later, I got another book that had a big eye staring out of the cover. The title was We Never Sleep. It was a history of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. But with a big eye staring at you, I thought, ah, put that in the bathroom too. <laughs> now this is a little half bathroom, so there's no shower, no steam. Next thing you know, we built bookshelves, and now we have three or four hundred of these Victorian-style illustrated <laughs> books in the bathroom. People walk in, they're a little taken aback, but there's loads of reading material. <laughs> and one of the rules of the collection is that nothing can be terribly valuable, because every once in a while a book falls off the shelf, and you can imagine Imagine where it ends up. Yeah. Uh, I like to end the talk talking about Bibles. And one of the reasons I like to do that is the Bible is the most commonly printed book of all time, probably always has been, probably always will be. And we sometimes get five and ten calls a week with people who have 100, 200 year old family Bibles. And in most cases, we have to say to them, if this is your family Bible and it's been handed down through the gen generations, sentimentally, it's priceless. Monetarily, maybe not so much. And there are exceptions, so it's always worth checking. There is the Gutenberg Bible, there are others. Um, those big old Victorian Bibles that have the beautifully embossed leather covers with the clasp and illustrations, <clears throat> in mint condition, they can sell $100, two, dollars $300 because they make wonderful gifts for ministers, priests, divinity students. Break one class, have one hinge go on them, they lose all that value. Now, sometimes at the beginning, middle, or end of those, they have family histories, births, deaths, marriages. Those can be invaluable to the local historical or genealogical society. But many times, all they want to do is Xerox out that page, maybe the title page. They don't want the whole Bible. Um, now, one of the things, again, I go into asides at times. Uh, one of the things I do do, and I hope people watch on t uh, TV, Antiques Roadshow. I've done that for about 20 years. It's a lot of fun to do. Uh, I mean, why would I ever go to Boise or Birmingham or, uh, or Omaha or whatever? But anywhere you go in this country, if you make any type of time or effort, the country's beautiful and the people are friendly. Don't talk about politics or religion, but it's, it's just a wonderful way to uh, get around the country. Um, and the way that show works is now they do it at smaller venues, museums and so on, so about 3,000 and the larger venues, 5,000 people come. You appraise on a Saturday from about 7.30 in the morning, sometimes told straight through to 7.30 at night, uh, so there are Three to five thousand people. Each person brings two items, so there's six to ten thousand items that come in. They tape about sixty or seventy or maybe a hundred that make up three hours of each day of TV, and it's a lot of fun. You never know what you're going to see. Hopefully, you get on TV. Someone brings you something that you get on. They don't pay us anything. No hotel, no flares, no travel, no nothing. But it's still they've got lines of people who want to come in and do it. But anyways. When I said we start at 7.30, sometimes we, of course, have to be there a little earlier. And I remember one of the cities, we were there, and we, among ourselves, said, how many Bibles do you think we'll see today? So we counted, 85 in one day in one city. Matter of fact, depending sometimes on who the other appraisers are, now we have a little pool going in the book table <laughs> occasionally. Uh, one, one last story that I'll say about Bibles. Did yeah. Did you make it on TV? I have. Um, the question is, do I make it on TV? At the, uh, the Antiques Roadshow. I, I've been doing it for 20 years. Not every single city have I made it because what comes in, but probably 85 to 90 percent of them. I've, you, I've been on TV. Been on show, uh, now, the thing is, for instance, they do five, five cities uh, now. They used to do more, but they do five now. Each city is three shows. I probably do three or four of the five cities. So I'm not on every show. And even if you get on TV once in a city, that means it's one third of the show. So it's not 
everyone getting on every show and and they like it also the other appraisers to get on and and it depends on what you get some things are much better than others uh, some are pretty amazing some things that are very very expensive don't get on TV because sometimes people come in and they have research material like this and you basically look at them and you go, what can I possibly tell you about this? You know a lot more about it than I know. And so part of it's the story. And then there are some things that aren't that high price, but just the story behind them are wonderful. And here's one story. My, my wife did this for a year or two. She didn't particularly like it. She comes with me on the shows and she likes the traveling and the, the sociability, but uh, there are some times, and this is even coming to groups like this, that you can know you can never ever make everybody happy. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much you try to tell, you don't make everybody happy. There was one city that um, my wife was doing the table and someone came up to her and she goes, I have a book signed by A. Lincoln. And my, you know, you always want to be nice and you look at it and you touch it and you hold it and you give a little bit of time. I mean, they've been waiting in lines and all that. And my wife then said, it is signed by A. Lincoln, just not the A. Lincoln that we both want it to be. And the lady got, how can you tell? Well, she says, well, the first clue is this book was printed in 1915. <laughs> and the lady goes, so? <laughs> and, and, and my wife goes, well, when I studied history, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865. Lady slammed the book shut, says, you don't know what you're talking about, and left out in a storm. I, I, so you can never make everybody happy. Uh, but, and, and an interesting thing also that, uh, this is a bit of an aside, so you ask a question, I go off in tangents. Uh, the, yes, <laughs> but, 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 but no, but uh, the other thing that, that people doing events like this and doing Antiques Roadshow, you think that everybody, if you don't tell them that their items and so on are worth thousands, millions of dollars, that they're disappointed. Actually, obviously, if, if you brought something in, I saw you had a box, and I tell you something's worth a million dollars, you'll probably be happy. But more people are thrilled. You go, oh, this really isn't worth anything. They go, great, because it sort of frees them. It's like, okay, now I don't have to worry about this. I can give it to my grandchildren. I can read it. I can get rid of it. I can give it to the libraries. So it's almost when you tell them more people are happy when you tell them it's not worth anything because it totally no responsibility. If you say something's worth 50, 100, 150, it doesn't change anybody's lifestyle. But on the other hand, it's too much that you can just say, oh, I don't have to worry about it anymore. If you say it's worth a million, they're happy too. That's another <laughs> one. Anyways, one last story about Bibles. Um, I went to an old church in Boston, well over a hundred year old church. They had a, a a large library that they just accumulated over the years. And the reason they wanted me there was to just look at the collection and see if there was anything that was valuable. Uh, I spent a day there and actually they had some nice books. It, it was fun. At, at the end of the day, the priest said to me, could you come down the basement? There are a few more books. I took a look at the books. And then there was a closet, probably more like a small room, it would cover this area here. Priest opened the door, front to back, floor to ceiling, top to bottom. It was stuffed with thousands of old Bibles. And I looked at the priest and I said, what is this? He says, well, people hate to throw away a book. They feel it's sacrilegious to throw away a Bible. So what happens when a parishioner dies and the family doesn't want the Bible? They come and they present it to the church. Uh -huh. And he says, what do we do? We very graciously accept it. We don't want to offend anybody. Then we go down, and open the door, put it in with the other. And he goes, and we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles. It just wouldn't be right. So I use it as an example to say that if you want to give something to a charity, Ask them if they want it first. Yeah. If they want it and can use it, it's great. Now, a couple of things. I will say I have my business card here. I do do the podcast. If you like 
this type of stories. Literally, I've, I think I've put out about 60, and every two weeks we put out another one. And it's basically just telling stories about books and people and so on. The way I do the appraisals, I do them totally informally. I don't do them in front of everybody. So basically, I end the formal part. So if anyone wants to go, Hopefully, the weather's supposed to stay warm enough that we can get home before it freezes. Uh, but I'll just end the talk if any, and just crowd around me. If anybody wants to stand over my shoulder and listen, great. Can uh, you pass those out for us? Uh, yeah, or you can just take them. Uh, but okay. here, uh, there's this, there's this. And, uh, but I'll say, say basically, I'll say thank you. If anybody has a big, big stack of books and there's a few people waiting, I might only do one or two of your books, then do everybody else's, and then do all the rest of yours. It's just not fair to keep everybody waiting. I'll say thank you very much, oh, and you. just bring things up. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you.